Welcome back. So far we have studied histogram, check sheets, Pareto charts and control charts out of the total 7 QC tools. Now in this lesson we will cover the remaining 3 QC tools. Let's begin. Cause and effect diagram is used to analyze a problem by mapping the different factors or the potential causes that can result in our problem, that is effect. We can make a cause and effect diagram by following these steps. First, we will write down in a box the quality characteristic that we want to improve in the middle right of a paper and then draw a thick arrow from the left side up to this box. In step 2, we will make two similar boxes on each side of the thick arrow and draw these branch arrows to the main arrow. These boxes will represent the classification of the factors. Professor Ishikawa has recommended to group these factors as raw material, equipment, method of work and method of inspection. I know most of us are using man-machine material method as main factors and also started using measurement and environment as the fifth or sixth M. There is no hard and fast rule here as to what the main factor should be as long as our purpose is to map every possible cause. Now under each of these four branches we will ask ourselves what can go wrong and write that factor as a twig onto this branch. For example, for the group material, we can ask what can go wrong in the material. There could be variation in axle bearing. So this becomes a twig on the material. Then we ask what can go wrong in the axle bearing that can cause a noise. We can add outer diameter and we can also add roughness. Then for each twig, we ask what can go wrong again. For outer diameter, it could be oversize or undersize. For roughness, it could be more than specification. In this way, we add to the cause and effect diagram until we have listed down all the possible factors that can result in our target quality characteristic. That means there must be something wrong in one or some of these listed factors due to which the problem has occurred. And now we have to verify which one of these factors is running out of specification and take actions accordingly. If you see, this diagram looks quite similar to a fishbone and therefore it is also known as a fishbone diagram. Or you can also call it Ishikawa diagram as it was invented by Professor Ishikawa. Also, you might have noticed that making a cause and effect diagram is more like doing a repeated YY analysis. And in a sense it is. The number of branches here shows that we have thoroughly reviewed our process and have captured almost every possible factor. A good cause and effect diagram will look like this. On the other hand, a cause and effect diagram that looks something like this one shows that we have a very shallow understanding of the process. While making a cause and effect diagram, it is recommended that we should acknowledge every potential cause proposed by the team and write it on the paper. We call it potential because we may not be sure if any change in this potential cause will have any effect on the problem that we are studying. So in order to validate the presence of any relation, we have another tool, scatter diagram. A scatter diagram is a graphical representation of the relationship between cause and effect or between two causes. This tool can also identify the strength and direction of the relationship between two variables. So once you have identified a few potential causes using an Ishikawa diagram, now we should be studying the relationship between the potential cause and effect keeping the effective or related ones and dropping the ineffective or unrelated ones. In order to make a scatter diagram, you need to have paired samples of data whose relationship you wish to investigate. For example, let's say we want to investigate the relationship between current and RPM of an electric motor. Then I should have data something like this. Just make sure that the data is numerical and can be plotted on a graph. Then draw a horizontal and a vertical axis of the graph. The cause values are usually placed on the horizontal axis and the effect values on the vertical axis. Now keep on plotting the dots on the graphs for each data point. If data values are repeated and fall on the same point, you can make a concentric circle and then another circle if required. That's it. Now just looking at the scatter diagram, we can identify a relation between the two factors. For example, a plot like this will represent that a strong positive correlation exists. 
and a plot with more dispersion or variation represents that a positive correlation may be present. Similarly, these are the plots for negative correlations. And a plot like this means there is no correlation between the two factors and they are independent of each other. Very rarely, you may get a plot with peaks and troughs, which could mean there is a relation between the two factors which changes the direction at a particular point. When a correlation is established, we can also interpolate this chart to estimate the value of effect for any given value of a cause. Finally, our last tool is graphs and charts. Graphs are the visual representation of raw data. Now you already know, in comparison to text, a human mind can process an image much faster to get the same data. For example, just by looking at this pictograph, you can understand the traffic condition is worse at around 9 in the morning and 5 in the evening. And then there are no motorbikes between 12 to 4 and no heavy transport in the daytime. That's the beauty of charts and graphs. They help to express and understand complex data in a simple format and in less space. However, we must understand that there are different types of graphs and charts, each having a specific purpose. Let us look at some of the popular graphs we use in our routine jobs. A bar graph. Bar graphs are used to compare factors that are grouped into categories. A pie chart. Pie charts are best to use when you are trying to compare parts of a system. However, they do not show changes over time. Then we have a combination of bar graph and a pie chart known as the stacked bar graph. Here we can compare the categories and the parts of the categories in one graph. Then we have a line graph. Line graphs are used to track changes over a period of time. Line graphs can also be used to compare changes for more than one group over the same period of time. Though bar graph can also be used for this purpose, it is always better to use line graphs because it also helps to show the trend and to make the prediction of the future events. A great example of the line graph is control charts. We can also combine bar graph and line graph to have a visual representation of Pareto principles, which we have already seen. Then we can use another version of the bar graph, that is histogram, as a visual representation of process variation. Similarly, a flowchart can help you understand the relation between different processes and factors and if you remember, we have used it while making cause and effect diagrams. You see, this is why graphs are the most important tool since it makes other tools easier to use and understand. So, these are the original 7QC tools as identified by Professor Ishikawa. Checksheets to gather the data, Pareto chart to prioritize the actions, Histogram to study the process distribution. Control charts to study the variation in process over time. Cause and effect diagram to map the cause and effect relationships. Scatter diagram to find or validate the correlation between cause and effect or between two factors. And finally graphs to visually represent the data for easy understanding. So that's all about 7QC tools. And I believe now you have a better understanding of the purpose and the difference between these 7 QC tools. In case you still have any doubts, you can ask me in the comments below. Thank you very much.